Hello, this is a brief lecture on chapter 8, Risk and Rates of Return. The focus of this chapter uh, is risk, uh, specifically standalone risk and portfolio risk, and then also understanding the relationship between risk and return through the capital asset pricing model and the security market line. So, when we're talking about investment risk, uh, there are two types. Uh, we have standalone risk for an individual investment or when we start grouping investments together into a portfolio, there is portfolio risk. And being able to understand how risk is quantified helps us make better decisions uh, as managers. So one thing that we want to understand is probability distributions. Uh, with any business decision uh, there or any investment, there is uh, a amount of probabilities of whether we'll see a high return, a low return, an average return. And so what we do is we take all of these probabilities and we create what we refer to as the expected rate of return. The expected rate of return is a weighted average uh, of the various possibilities. We can see that in this table here. Uh, so we have uh, some hypothetical investment alternatives. Uh, we see that over on the far left hand side we have different economic states. Uh, we see in the middle we have an average economic state that has the highest probability. We have above average and below average and then uh, with relatively small probabilities, a 10% probability of a recession, also a 10% uh, possibility of a boom. We also look at uh, some different investments. And so the first investment after the probabilities is T-bills or treasury bills. Now we see here that the rate of return does not change for this investment regardless of the economic state. However, we see that uh, the other four, uh, HT, uh, COLL, uh, USR, and MP, uh, they do fluctu fluctuate as uh, the economy changes. So let's look at an example here. So for HT or high tech, uh, what we would want to do is use the expected return formula, which we see here on the far left hand side, is the sum of the probabilities times that rate of return. And so we see here that we start off with that 10% from the recession. Uh, if we go back and we see that for 10% for recession, it's a negative 29.5% uh, for below average, it's a negative 9.5%. So we see that, um, and as we uh, go through all of those and eventually get all of the probabilities, probabilities should add up to 100%, we get an expected return for 9.9% or almost 10%. If we did that for the rest of them, we see here uh, that for... Uh, USR, that was US rubber, for COLL, that was um, collections, um, and then market would be a overall market. And so uh, once we have the expected return, we can then take that expected return and put it into the standard deviation formula, which is uh, the square root of the variance. And so if we see over here on the left-hand side, uh, the sigma, lowercase sigma, represents the standard deviation. Sigma uh, is the square root of the variance, so the variance is the standard deviation squared. Uh, and so we see the uh, formula here, the square root of uh, the variance formula. And so if we were to use the T-bill as an example, the T-bill, the rate didn't change. So the rate for a specific probability minus the rate from uh, the uh, expected return would be the same, which gives you zeros, which uh, once you start multiplying all of these through, uh, you end up with a zero standard deviation for T-bills. This is the mathematical reason why we say that treasury bills are a risk-free investment, meaning that their standard deviation is zero, meaning that their expected return in any given scenario matches the expected return as a weighted average. Now we see in the other scenarios, that's not the case. Uh, HTM, COLL, uh, USR, 
the standard deviation is is different. Uh, and we see that some of them are fairly high, 20%. Uh, some are low, 11.2%, but then we have to look at it as it pertains to that expected return. And so if we were to graph these out, we would see that uh, the uh, U.S. rubber, that USR, there's the expected return of 7.3%, but then there's the standard deviations, which uh, pushes the, uh, the curve out. Uh, we see that HT... Uh, so uh, USR, uh, USR had a standard deviation of 18.8, .8. HT had 20%, and so we see that the curve is flatter for HT, meaning that the tails are further out. So uh, if we were to look at this, we see here uh, that the uh, T-bills, expected return of 3%, risk of 0. Uh, high tech, expected return of 9.5%, risk 20%. Uh, and what that means is that in a normally distributed curve, which would be a, a review from uh, a statistics class that you would have had in your academic past, um, that one standard deviation from a normally distributed curve is 34% on each side, uh, uh, or the, those probabilities. Uh, so that first standard deviation, which represents 68% of possible outcomes, we see that uh, at that 9.9% to the first standard deviation, uh, it could go as high as 29.9%, or uh, we could go the opposite way and deduct that 20% from that 9.9, and we'd get a 10.1, a negative 10.1. Uh, we see that collections in U.S. rubber as it pertains to um, their expected return as a relationship to their standard deviation, they're probably actually more risky. But the question is, is how do we determine higher risk within these various options? Well, this is where the coefficient of variation comes in. Uh, so we see we take the standard deviation and divide it by the expected return. So if we were to take those values, divide it here, we see uh, that that high tech actually has one of the lowest coefficients of variation. Collections actually has the highest. And so this is a way of being able to rank order um, a risk level for various investments. Another way of looking at risk is what's referred to as the Sharpe ratio. And so we see here the Sharpe ratio is taking the expected return minus the risk-free rate and dividing it by the standard deviation. Uh, and so uh, this gives another method. Uh, Sharp, William Sharp, is a uh, modern financial theorist uh, which has contributed significantly to modern finance theory. Um, but this is uh, one of his claims to fame. So uh, that was standalone risk. Now let's talk about portfolio risk. So with portfolio risk, uh, what we do is we start looking at the values from those individual investments and we start bringing them together. And so we see in this scenario, uh, two stock portfolio, half of it is in high tech, half of it is in collection. Well, mm -hmm. to determine what the expected return would be, we take a weighted average, it happens to be equal weight, so it's 50% for each. And so now, instead of uh, an expected return of 9.9% for just a high-tech investment or 1.1% for just a collections investment, we now have half and half, and so our expected return is 5.5%. Now, to calculate the standard deviation of that portfolio, we cannot just average the standard deviations of the individual investments. Uh, what we actually have to do is apply this new weighted average uh, to come up with the standard deviation. And so uh, what is uh, worth noting uh, is that even though the standard, uh, the, uh, the, ex the weighted average, the expected return, it is much, it, it's, you know, it, it's truly a mathematical average. Uh, if we would have gone back to the standard deviations of high tech and collections, uh, we see that if you were to take the average of that, it would be significantly higher than what we get here. And the reason for that is diversification. 
This is the reason why we diversify our portfolio so that we can actually attain a return which is better as it pertains to risk. And so we see here that the uh, coefficient of variation for the portfolio is 0.84. If we look at the uh, co uh, coefficient of variation uh, for each of the others, it's significantly higher. And so uh, trying to uh, mitigate risk is one of the essential functions of diversification. Now, if we were to illustrate this graphically, what we see is that as we have more and more stocks, that's the x-axis there, uh, that uh, the uh, portfolio risk uh, declines. Now, the, uh, you know, the, the individual measure declines until it gets to a, uh, uh, an amount that makes sense. Uh, but this is what we would see is a downward sloping exponential function. Now, in looking at this risk, uh, going back to standalone risk, uh, standalone risk is market risk plus diversifiable risk. Diversifiable risk is that risk unique to uh, the business. Uh, and so market risk, because it can't be eliminated with diversification, uh, we need to be able to measure it. And so one way that we measure it is through uh, is through beta. And so let's look at that, uh, that value, but first let's just identify, well, you know, what are the issues with diversification? Well, uh, if an investor chooses to hold a, a one stock portfolio, um, you know, would the investor be compensated for extra risk? Well, no. Um, uh, standalone risk is not important to a well-diversified investor because we're, again, we're trying to reduce that risk. Uh, also, there, there becomes a, uh, a lot of uh, unnecessary risk levels that we want to, uh, to eliminate. And so, one way in which we can take beta, and so we're not, uh, in this class, uh, the focus is not to be able to calculate beta, but to understand it as um, a mathematical function, is through the capital asset pricing model. And so the capital asset pricing model uh, helps us identify a what we refer to as a security market line uh, or a regression line, uh, which identifies the trade-off between risk and return. And so we see here that the formula to calculate the capital asset pricing model, so what uh, the return ought to be for a uh, particular investment, we see that the R subset I, the, re the return on the investment, equals R subset RF, which is the risk-free rate of return, plus the difference of the rate of the market minus the rate of the risk-free rate of return. So the difference of those two values is what we refer to as the market risk premium. And then we multiply that difference by the beta. And so the beta uh, looks at the correlation of the uh, returns uh, for uh, a stock relative to the market as well as the standard deviations for the market and that's particular in that particular return. So uh, what is that market risk premium? Well, it's that additional return over the risk-free rate. Uh, so this depends on perceived risk, uh, a uh, investor's uh, aversion to risk, but we see here that on average, 4% to 8% seems to be where we're at. So uh, when we are looking at beta, uh, one thing that we want to be aware of is that if a stock has a beta of one, uh, it means uh, that it is uh, just as risky as the average market. If the beta is higher than one, there's more risk. If it's less than one, uh, it's less risky. Uh, as we see here, most betas uh, have a range between 0.5 and 1.5. It is possible to see a negative beta. Uh, that, re that would relate to the correlation of the individual security uh, to the overall market. So uh, if there's an investor uh, investment, uh, which is counter cyclical to the overall market, we would see a potentially negative beta.
So, uh, what we see here, um, a, uh, a regression line, uh, which is trying to identify how beta connects to the security market line. So we see here, uh, we have uh, different years, we have uh, different returns, the so market relative to the individual asset. Uh, and so if we were to do a regression line, we would come up with a way of understanding that relationship between market risk and uh, the overall uh, the overall returns. Uh, and so we see here, uh, if we were to have gone through the process of calculating beta, again, for this class, you just need to understand that beta is the measure of uh, the trade-off between risk and return relative to the market. We see that high tech has the highest beta, so uh, there's the most risk there, and that uh, is to be expected because it had the highest standard deviation. Uh, we see here the market, uh, that's the overall market, so the beta would be one. We see the other uh, investments, the beta is less, and so uh, we would want to identify that. So. Uh, what this does is now that we have the beta, we have the risk-free rate, we can then start calculating required rates of return. So uh, we see in this scenario for that high-tech uh, risk-free rate was that 3%. We have the market risk premium, which was the 8% minus the 3%, which is why we have 5% multiplied by the beta. And so now we see required returns, and then we can compare them to expected returns. Well. Uh, we see that here that the high tech, uh, the capital asset pricing model uh, would dictate a 9.55% uh, return. So uh, this model is undervaluing compared to uh, what the expected value would be using that weighted average uh, calculation. And so we see that um, uh, through each of these. Uh, and so this is chapter eight of Fundamentals of Financial Management.